Hi, this is Dee Thompson, author of Fallen Poppies, and this is Chapter 12. And this is Chapter 13. Chapter 12 The next day, Jo Beth tended to the chores as usual. She was surprised at how easy it was to fall back into old routines. The waning winter sunshine shone down on her face as she stood in her yard, surveying the dirt that would soon be home to a vibrant spring garden. Taking a deep breath, she tasted the sweet anticipation of spring on her tongue. How she loved this time of year. It was a period for fresh beginnings, and this year, it was appropriate with her new life spread before her. She walked around her garden, taking in the view of the not yet freshly tilled earth. She kneeled to inspect a few stones and ran her fingers along the rugged, frozen soil. She could almost sense the carrots and onions pushing through the dirt and the lettuce leaves unfurling under the summer sky. In her mind, she saw a perfect crop of carrots, onions, lettuce, and other vegetables growing in neat rows, lush and vibrant in the sun. Noise from the front of the house disrupted Jo Beth's thoughts. Curious and a little apprehensive, she went to investigate. Walking around the corner of the building, she stopped short. She spotted a buggy with a group of women seated inside, rumbling its way toward the dwelling. She gulped, recalling the last group of women she had encountered. She felt trapped and exposed in the open yard. The urge to dash behind a nearby bush to get out of view instinctively took over her. The carriage moved closer and closer toward its destination. Sweat began to form on her brow. What should she do? Where should she hide? Hello, waved a pretty brunette. Her other hand held the leather reins controlling two horses that pulled the wagon full of women. It was too late. They had already spotted her. Hello. Jo Beth stood nervously and walked toward the buggy that had now stopped. The women began to emerge from the wagon, chatting amongst themselves. Did we come at a bad time? Asked the same brunette. She looked to be about 20 years old. No, no. Jo Beth said, clutching her shawl around her shoulders, her nerves starting to settle. The women wore brightly colored scarves and wide-brimmed sun hats that cast shadows on their faces. Each of their laps was occupied by intricately woven baskets full of fruit, freshly baked bread, and desserts. As the smell of the treats filled the air, a warm, welcoming atmosphere instantly enveloped the group. There was no reason for her to fear these women, or anyone else. Would you like to come in for refreshments? She asked shyly, not used to entertaining. She was not the same young girl she had once been. It felt strange and a little frightening to be participating in activities long thought gone. Well, if you are sure we are not interrupting, a young blonde about 18 asked, Jo Beth looked them over cautiously, soaking their very essence in. There were four of them, all about her age. They seemed friendly enough. Friends. It had been so long since she had a girlfriend. No, you are not interrupting at all. Just give me a minute to clean up. Jo Beth ushered them toward the house. The four young women followed suit, with welcome baskets held snugly in their arms. Walking with her back straight, she couldn't help but smile to herself. Spring was indeed in the air. Jo Beth nervously poured hot water from her kettle into matching blue cups. Tiny white flowers embroidered the bottom, giving them a dainty feminine feel. The four women had seated themselves around the kitchen table. Their baskets full of treats were now laid out before them. They were as diverse in appearance as were their choices of gifts. Sarah, the petite blonde who had spoken outside, was 17 and married for a year. She had brought homemade bread with pickled eggs. Mandy was a little plump 18-year-old woman with thick red hair divided down the middle, her tresses on the sides carefully designed into a French twist, which coiled at the back of her neck in a smartly interwoven bun a style she'd adopted since her marriage. She proudly displayed her famous cinnamon muffins topped with melted white icing. 
Heather was the youngest at 16 and expecting her first child. She removed smaller bowls and the plaid towels that covered them from her basket, exposing the colorful berries inside. Each bowl held a different color of berry. 20-year-old Lori was the tall, thin, attractive brunette who had driven the wagon full of greeters to Joe Beth's door. From her basket, she gently removed two candles. Joe Beth marveled at their sight, taking in the fine details of the delicate curves and interlocking shapes. The wax seemed to sway and dance in the flickering light as if it were a living material. Seeing Joe Beth's expression, Lori was pleased with her choice of gifts. Her candles were her passion, and up until she married two months ago, she sold them at the local store. Now she made them for herself. Her husband would not allow her to sell them for money, afraid people would think he could not provide for his new bride. It embarrassed him. Lori sighed, trying to push aside the memory of her joy in selling her prized candles to her fellow neighbors and reveling in their compliments. She was married now and had to listen to her husband's requests. She cleared her mind of what she had lost and focused on the present. She was a wife and a future mother. There was no point in lingering in the past. Besides, being a spinster for life was no longer a concern. Larry said a new young couple had moved into George and Diana's house, and the girls and I decided to make a visit. Lori spoke, the self-proclaimed leader of the small group. The other girls nodded in unison. Do you like it here so far? Asked Sarah, sipping her tea. Her eyebrows knitted together in anticipation of Joe Beth's answer. She was curious about the frail-looking young woman who bustled about the kitchen, trying to scratch up some edible snacks of her own. Yes, Joe Beth looked back toward the table, enjoying the banter between the girls. Sarah smiled supportively. She liked Joe Beth's pretty face and knew they would become fast friends. Well, you will just have to go into town with us next week and meet the rest of the ladies. We all go to Max's Cafe. Mandy proclaimed, straightening her spine, and smiled triumphantly, relishing in being the first to tell Joe Beth the news about Max's. It was a favorite place to gossip and escape the monotony of housework. You will just love it. It's just like the cafes in France. Jean-Claude, the restaurant's owner, is adorable. He is a short little man with a thin, twisted mustache that twitches when he talks rapidly in his accent. It's so European, so much razzmatazz, Mandy squealed. Our town is just wonderfully modern. I feel like I already love it, Joe Beth said in all honesty. For the first time since her parents had passed away, she felt normal. It felt good to be back in her old skin. Better. She was no longer a young, naive girl. She was a grown woman with the experiences of a lifetime behind her. I hear your husband's sister lives with you, Heather beamed across the table at Joe Beth. Like Sarah, she immediately liked Joe Beth. Joe Beth nodded, lowering her eyes. She could not look at Heather in the face and lie. She was certain she would see that her marriage to Alan was a hoax, plainly written all over her face. Heather leaned forward in her chair, her eyes fixed intently on Joe Beth. She could feel the stares of the other three weighing on her as well. The atmosphere in the room felt thick with anticipation, and Joe Beth looked down at her hands nervously. She could feel a smile tugging at her lips as she thought about Shauna, her pale blonde hair, infectious laugh, and how she had come into Joe Beth's life and changed it forever. Does it bother you? Heather asked again. Joe Beth looked up at them, her smile now wider. No, said Joe Beth strongly and firmly. She is my sister. I love her. Well, it is always good to get along with one's in-laws, proclaimed Lori. She was thinking of Larry's younger sister, whom she did not like. The sister felt Lori was too old to marry her brother. Cecilia was a constant thorn in her side, and she could not help but notice the love in Joe Beth's eyes for her sister-in-law. Lori felt envious. Joe Beth seemed to have everything. She is just a little thing, isn't she, Joe Beth? She asked. 
She is, Joe Beth's eyes shone with pride at the thought of Shauna. The little girl was smaller than most children her age, but her spirit was larger than life. She had already seen and experienced more than a child should, but Joe Beth, with Alan by her side, was determined to create a new life for them, a better one. There were no more secrets, not really. Closing her eyes, Jo Beth felt a wave of calmness sweep over her. She could almost feel Alan's strong arms around her, the weight of him, wrapped in a blanket of security and safety. It was her Alan feeling. She felt married to him. He loved her, and she loved him. There was no more shame. Alan had taken it away by continuing to love her even after knowing the truth. They had a chance to begin once more. Jonah had been right. She could move on from her past and love. Would anyone care for more tea? She rose from her chair and made her way to the fire. She carefully took hold of the black iron kettle, the heat radiating from its handle. She thought of Jonah, and her pang of sadness at his absence reminded her that no one could ever take his place. Closing her eyes for a moment, she tried to push down the pain and longing of his absence. She opened her eyes, stealing her resolve, holding back tears as she waited patiently for a response. Oh, yes, me, Mandy piped up. Joe Beth, do tell. What are you going to plant in that glorious garden? The sun glinted in Joe Beth's eyes as she glanced out the window and surveyed her new surroundings with satisfaction. She turned away from the view, kettle held firm, feeling the moment's weight in her hands. I have plenty of plans, she smiled warmly at her guest. In this new place were possibilities. Life was going to be different here. She was counting on it. Chapter 13 Jo Beth easily fit in with the social elite of the town. She was a young, pretty, and kind woman. The local inhabitants drank her up. She was a perfect hostess when she entertained guests. Her table was always decorated with fabulous chocolate cakes and scrumptious ginger snap cookies, muffins always dripping with sweet icing and other delicious snacks. As the months passed, Jo Beth's teas had become quite the social event for the ladies of the small town. Shauna was instantly a popular friend among her peers. They were constantly under Jo Beth's feet, begging for yummy treats. Alan laughed happily, seeing his ladies become such a success. Life was shining on them, and Jo Beth could hardly believe it as she basked in their newfound glory. Their past seemed like another lifetime ago, or someone else's nightmare. Every night, sitting around the dinner table, she would say thanks to God, holding Alan and Shauna's hands tight. Their lives had turned around for the better, and she was so grateful. On a bright summer day, Jo Beth was again socializing with her four closest friends, These were the same four young women she had met that first winter day, 16 months ago. They sat around the familiar kitchen, nibbling on peanut butter cookies and gossiping about the latest news in town. Jo Beth, now very acquainted with the daily comings and goings of the town, joined in wholeheartedly. Her shy reservations had long ago melted away. Mandy, the one who always knew the latest bits of information, turned to the girls with a twinkle in her eye. Guess what? She asked, distastefully screwing her face up. Jo Beth and the others leaned in closer to hear. She was excited. She had news of her own she wanted to tell. Mrs. Black at the general store had confided that they would be getting telephones soon. The very thought of being able to talk to someone from their home to hers dumbfounded Jo Beth. Modern technology excited and frightened her. What would they think of next? She hoped Mandy did not know about the telephones. Mrs. Black had promised not to tell a soul, knowing the young woman wanted to be the one to share the details with them. 
Like everyone else in town, Mrs. Black adored Jo Beth and her little family. Mandy sat back and wrinkled her spotted nose. Someone moved into that old house down on Bayer's Road. Oh, really? Jo Beth asked, delighted. Her piece of gossip had not been revealed. She nodded her brows, confused. She was familiar with this road and couldn't think of any houses along its unkempt grassy lane. It was in the poorest part of town, and she was baffled as to who would want to live down there. Oh, well, the more the merrier, she shrugged. She quickly thought of what to bring the new family. Peanut butter cookies or maybe sandwiches made with thick homemade bread. She looked up at the four pairs of eyes glaring at her disapprovingly. Taken aback, she sat silent, confused at what she had done wrong. Yes, I heard. Lori snorted disgustedly. Jo Beth was becoming increasingly perplexed. This person who had moved on to Bayer Road was apparently someone of distaste to her friends. She is a whore, not a person you go greeting, Heather said, patting Jo Beth's hand like a confused child. She could not help noticing Jo Beth's puzzlement and felt she needed to save her naive friend further discomfort. She lives there with a baby and no husband. The father, whoever he is, ran out on her when she was pregnant. Jo Beth's face turned red. The little baby boy she had delivered popped into her mind. He had been so small and so sweet. It broke her heart to remember him gasping in vain for air. She had no husband when he was viciously conceived. There were so many bits and pieces her friends didn't know about her. Yes, grunted Sarah, pushing her blonde hair away from her face. It had been neatly wrapped in a bun, but some strands had escaped in her fury to speak her mind. Her eyes became angry little slits. Do you blame the father? No proper girl would get herself in a marrying way. Serves the trash right, snipped Lori as she stood up for another cup of tea. Rigid with anger, she turned when her cup was full and sat back down with a thump. And do you want to know something else? She boomed. The three other women looked wide-eyed in anticipation. Jo Beth sat back, her face crimson red. The others assumed the conversation embarrassed her delicate senses. Sarah and Heather almost felt they, too, should blush. Only a proper girl would turn the cardinal color Jo Beth had. I even heard that she once lived with a group of boys, and she was the only girl. Jo Beth turned pale and swallowed hard, her throat becoming increasingly dry. She took a drink of her tea, looking at her friends, who had transformed into a den of lionesses. If they knew about her past, they would be appalled, but they would never know her. I bet she doesn't even know who the father is. Can you imagine? Sarah gasped, looking quite horrified. Heather put a protective hand over her once again enormous stomach. She had become pregnant right after the birth of her daughter. Oh, that poor baby girl, what fate awaits her, that innocent child in the care of that hussy, the shame on that baby when she starts to get older, she will end up just like her mother. All the women nodded with certainty. Jo Beth could do nothing but stare at them in disbelief. I think someone should get the baby away from that woman before she does it any more harm. Lori glared, feeling a twisting in the pit of her gut. It was not fair for this tramp to have a child when she so wanted one herself. It was starting to become apparent that she might be barren. She and Larry had been trying to have a child for two years without success. A tear formed in the corner of her eye. She covertly wiped it away, not wanting her audience to see how upset she was. Larry's sister constantly commented about Lori's inability to produce children. She said it was because Lori had waited too long to snag herself a husband. Lori would retaliate, telling her sister-in-law that she was not yet 22 and that women had children much later than that in their lives. Yes, but their first, 
Cecilia would answer cruelly. Lori squeezed her lips tightly together, causing the blood to drain away, leaving them a grayish pink color. You don't really mean to take this woman's child, do you? Joe Beth interrupted. She had to speak up. The pain of losing her own son was still too fresh to keep quiet. Taking her baby? She doesn't deserve a baby, cried Heather in an emotional outbreak so common for her. Joe Beth was not sure if it was the pregnancy or if she was just prone to outbursts. She had never seen Heather when she was not with child. That baby deserves better than a trollop, someone like Lori and Larry. Heather continued, they all knew how much Lori wanted a child. Joe Beth had been a confidant a few times to Lori's monthly disappointments. Lori felt that since Joe Beth was not yet pregnant herself, after a year of marriage, she would understand her pain the most. Joe Beth noticed a glimmer of hope in Lori's eyes. She wanted the woman's baby for herself. That woman, Tamara, doesn't deserve a baby. She should belong to Lori, Sarah said, repeating Heather. She felt proud of herself. She had discovered the perfect solution for the baby and her friend. Tamara? Joe Beth whispered, knocking her cup and spilling her tea all over the table. Lori jumped to the rescue, grabbing a rag from the counter. Joe Beth took it from her, embarrassed, and began to wipe up her mess. She could feel the eyes of her friends drilling into her back. Joe Beth, is something wrong? Lori asked. I know the subject is horrible, but dear, Lori said tenderly, such things do happen in the world. You must not be so sensitive. Nothing is wrong, Joe Beth lied, mopping up the tea before it stained the lace tablecloth. She concentrated on the work at hand, not wanting them to see her deceit. Tamara was here? This could not be happening, not now when things were going so well. The women left some time later. Joe Beth was glad to see them go. They eventually stopped talking about Tamara and moved on to a more pleasant conversation, like who was getting married and having babies. She told her news about the telephones and tried to act excited, but the accounts of Tamara plagued her mind. She had to know if this woman was her Tamara. Joe Beth dreaded what she already knew was the answer. The Tamara she had known had lived with a group of boys, the same boys she herself had lived with. She sat down to finish a quilt she had been working on for Heather's new baby. Her mind kept wandering, causing her to make mistakes. She put her work down and grabbed a shawl, throwing it carelessly over her shoulders. Staring at the door, she wondered what she was doing. If the woman was Tamara, her comfortable life would be over. Did she want to risk it all? This life she and Alan had created for themselves, and for what? A girl who had never been very nice to her. She is family, Joe Beth had said out loud, ashamed of herself. Even though Tamar had fought hard to make her feel unwelcome, in the end, they had come to some kind of truce. She looked around her spotless home. It smelled of happiness and comfort. A rag doll sat sideways on a cushioned chair, waiting for its owner to return home to play. Quilting lay slumped in her basket. Alan's pants were hidden beneath, waiting to be mended. This was her home. Her home with Alan and Shauna. She sighed, opened the door, and walked out. Plenty of thoughts ran through her mind as she walked down the overgrown path. Once. She even turned to go back, but changed her mind, continuing on. She had to know if the girl was Tamara. Joe Beth kept remembering the day she had fainted while washing clothes with the wild, black-haired beauty. Tamara had been frantic with fear. She had cared for her when Joe Beth felt no one cared. If this woman was Tamara, she couldn't turn her back on her. Jonah had not turned on Joe Beth when he found out the ugly truth about her. Neither had Alan. She was stronger for their love and devotion. 
How could she even think of not doing the same for Tamara? She continued down the path to the only house on the road. It was a run-down shack, the type of place they might have stayed in in the old days. A chill ran up her spine. She was suddenly afraid of ending up in one of these shacks once again. She took a deep breath, shaking off the creeping sensations, and knocked on the gray wooden door. Inside, shuffling could be heard as Jobeth held her breath, afraid to move. The door swung open fiercely, exposing a pale, dreadfully gaunt woman with blazing black hair. Jobeth gasped at how awful the woman looked, dressed in a ragged red dress that showed off too much of her thin breasts. Dark, angry eyes glared fire in expectation of a fight. Her nostrils flared. It could only be Tamara. Hello, Joe Beth said weakly, swallowing back her surprise. Even though she had expected the creature in front of her to be Tamara, she was not prepared for what she saw. Skin had concealed her bones. Dark circles smudged the bottom of her hollow eyes. What has happened to you? She thought, feeling guilty. She was the picture of health. Life had been good in the past year, and it showed on her, just as it showed how hard it had been on Tamara. Jo Beth had gained weight and turned into a slender woman instead of the scrawny girl she had once been. Tamara was a ghastly white, whereas Jo Beth's complexion was tanned and healthy from hours spent in her garden. Her hair was bright and shiny, in the latest style, piled high off her neck. Although her clothes were modest, they were stylish, clean, and new. It seemed her misgiving about the group of people they had parted ways with so long ago had come true. The concerns she had were answered by the skeletal woman before her. They had not done so well. Have you come to stir up shit? Tamara steamed in her familiar voice. Some things did not change. She was still as feisty as ever. Well, take your Miss Pris ass out of here. I ain't gonna listen to your save the soul crap. For such a frail looking creature, Tamara was still full of vinegar. Don't you recognize me? Joe Beth asked, knowing very well she looked different. It's me, Joe Beth. Tamara took a closer look. She did not recognize the sanctimonious individual before her. I was with Alan and John. She stopped and took a deep breath, not knowing why she suddenly felt as though she had run all the way there. And Jonah, remember? I was with a little girl named Shauna. It all seems so long ago. Jonah's beautiful face saturated Joe Beth's mind, as it often did. She quickly brushed the thought aside. There would be time later to think of him. As Jonah would say, the living need you. Joe Beth, Tamara whispered. A sparkle of light flickered in her dark eyes for a moment and just as quickly died out. What do you want? She answered coolly. For a moment, she had felt hope and then, examining Joe Beth's appearance, had dismissed it. This was not the same person she had encountered years ago. Can I please come in? It's cold out here, Joe Beth lied. She was not cold, but she could see Tamara shiver and tell she had nothing beneath her thin garment. Her dark nipples stood erect through her dress, causing Joe Beth to avert her eyes from the sight. Tamara shifted just enough to allow Joe Beth to enter, not once taking notice of her embarrassment. The inside of the shack was drafty, damp, and filthy. There was no furniture to be seen, only a crumpled mound of clothing in the middle of the dirty floor. In the corner stood a solitary cradle, Joe Beth could not help eyeing. How long have you lived here? She asked, forcing herself to look around the rest of the room. Tamara crossed her arms over her breasts. She began to walk around Joe Beth, circling her like a vulture. Resentment was plainly written on her face. Just came, she snipped. Jo Beth could not help but feel pity for the bony mortal before her. 
Never had she seen someone so pathetic and so in need. Looks like you're headed in the right way, Tamara conveyed in her twangy voice. It had been a long time since Jobeth had heard such ragged speech. She had prided herself on correcting Alan and Shauna's broken dialect. When did you leave Alan and Jonah? Tamara presumed, giving Jobeth a critical look. There was no way Jobeth had stayed with them. She looked too much like a society woman. Somehow, she managed to pick herself up and get back to the life she had obviously lived before, dumping Alan and Jonah the first chance she had. I didn't leave them, Jobeth said, feeling the air go suddenly thick and stale. She could not breathe and worried about the infant she assumed was in the cradle. You means you still with them? Tamara sounded surprised. Well, Jobeth stalled, dreading telling Tamara about Jonah. She had always been tender toward him. I knew it. They, Tamara stifled a laugh with the back of her claw-like hand. They dumped you. Shauna and I are still with Alan, Jobeth swallowing, trying to rid her throat of the familiar ball that formed every time she thought of her dead friend. What about Jonah? Tamara shrieked looking like a caged animal ready to attack. You didn't leave him alone, did you? Of course not, Joe Beth countered back, appalled. Do you think I would do that to him? A sad, pitiful wail broke the increasing tension mounting between the two women. They both turned at the same time toward the bassinet where the cries originated. Way to go, you woke the kid, Tamara stormed toward the cradle and roughly picked up the infant inside. She was dressed in a ratty gray sleeper that had a damp spot growing near her bottom. Joe Beth's heart skipped a beat. The baby had curly black hair plastered to her small, wet head. My baby, she whispered, remembering her tiny son with the same black, curly hair. Her chest hurt, and she didn't know why. All she knew was she had to see the child. Can I hold her? She asked Tamara. The child seemed pitiful in her mother's skeletal arms. Resting the squirming infant into the crook of her arm, Tamara could not help noticing Joe Beth's look of longing. She was confused. Why was Joe Beth here? What did she want? Why are you acting like this? Joe Beth asked coolly, her eyes not leaving the wailing newborn. Small fists belted the air with a fury equal to the child's mother. I haven't seen or heard from you in two years. We shouldn't be fighting. She focused hungrily on the baby. Tamara slowly approached Joe Beth, the babe still crying in her arms. Joe Beth feared the other girl would drop the child. She was so frail looking. Why on God's big old earth would I ever be happy to see the likes of you? Tamara threw back her head and laughed. With quick, sudden movements, she popped out a pale breast and began to nurse the baby. The infant sucked forcefully from the flat, pallid bosom, scrunching her face up and turning red. The offered breast did not look like it could nourish the child. From the looks of anguish on the newborn's face, it wasn't far from the truth. I didn't even like you. You just here to look good in front of your friends? Helping the whore to save her soul, are you now, Joe Beth? Tamara cooed, ignoring the child. Stop it! Joe Beth collapsed to the dirty floor, causing dust to fly up around her and gently tumble down onto her clean skirt. She did not know why she dropped to the ground so theatrically. She just did, and she looked at Tamara beseechingly. No tears fell from her eyes but she could see water droplets forming in Tamara's dark orbs. Please, Tamara, I am here to help. Don't be a fool and let your pride get in the way. We are family, the only family either of us has. We must stick together and not fight. Something in Tamara's tough shell cracked. She had been alone and ridiculed for so long. Now, here was Joe Beth a woman of respect, on the ground, begging for her friendship, calling her kin. A sob escaped her chapped lips. 
she bent down, defeated, beside Joe Beth on the dirty floor. Someone wanted her, wanted to love her. She hugged the baby close to her exposed chest and began to cry. She was so alone. Joe Beth wrapped loving arms around the scrawny shoulders, shaking with emotion. She held Tamara tightly, comforting her. Don't worry anymore, she stroked the black mass of curly hair. It felt surprisingly soft. You are home now. You are home. <laughs>